Good evening, you're watching The Big Story with Harry Anto Duman. I'm Olivia Quay, coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. It's the first day of circuit breaker measures in Singapore. Workplaces are shut except those in essential services. And starting tomorrow, all schools will move to full home-based learning. During this four-week circuit breaker, residents are urged to stay at home and only go out for essential reasons like grocery shopping or to buy takeaway meals. It's the government's strictest measure yet to contain the spread of COVID-19 and is slated to last until May 4th. Well, earlier today, the Straits Times video team hit the streets to see how the public and businesses are coping on day one. Closed shops, empty dining areas and quiet streets. This is the new normal Singapore will see for the next month as COVID-19 circuit breaker measures kicked in today. Essential services such as food establishments, transport and clinics will remain open for members of the public who are otherwise encouraged to stay home. Yeah, most customers have been staying at home because I can say that most customers, they like to dine here. The problem is that they, there's more dining here, so it's, it's really a great impact on to all the stockholders. So. Sometimes there's a few customers who are quite stubborn that don't listen to us, but we, we try to uh, keep track on the distancing and hope that they will listen to us in, uh, because of the safety measures because of this virus. Uh, usually I tap out, so it doesn't really affect me and I think it's good because like, we should practice social distancing, especially now, so I think it's a good move by the government. Mm. Uh, it's really quiet, like there's like barely anyone and barely any queue, which is good I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The thing is, first thing, uh, I need to buy some stuff, not much, only for the about the most one week, that's all. It's very troublesome to take away food from Kopitiam, back, back to home. So uh, we prefer to cook at home because it's more convenient and more saving. Just popped out, got my regular coffee and supporting the local business by picking up uh, the bread from the, the bread shop. Yeah, I'm trying to minimize going out because I know I have choice to go buy the food, so that's why I go to take out. <laughs> Year around, the food is so expensive. That's so hopefully um, this will work and we'll get back to normal as soon as possible. For the full video, head on to streetstimes.com. Now, if you're still unsure of what is and isn't allowed during this four-week period, here's a quick summary of the do's and don'ts. If you want to eat out, dining in at all food outlets, it's not allowed. But you can do takeaway or delivery. In fact, you cannot even eat or drink while waiting for your food to be prepared. If you need to see the doctor, all public and private hospitals remain open, as do all GP clinics, polyclinics, off-site specialist clinics and community hospitals. But aesthetic services or traditional Chinese medicine treatments like acupuncture are not allowed. If you need to buy groceries, wholesale markets, wet markets, supermarkets and provision shops will still be open. But when you go shopping, you must keep a safe distance from others. Follow the markings on the floor, including at wet markets. And there is no need to hoard food. The food supply chain is still operating. If you want to visit relatives or friends, try to avoid socialising beyond your own household or moving from place to place. Reside in one place for now. You can still keep in touch with your family members and friends through video calls or phone calls. For the gentlemen who need the frequent haircut, hair salons and barber services will be opened. But only to provide simple haircuts, long services like perming or colouring are not allowed. Now I have two daughters. If you're a parent as well and want to bring your children out, Please don't. In any case, all museums and attractions like the Singapore Zoo, Jurong Bird Park, Night Safari and the Science Centre are closed. Shopping malls as well. If you're watching us on YouTube, the full list of the do's and don'ts is in the description below. Now, this unprecedented situation is a tough time indeed, but medical experts have stressed repeatedly that staying at home and avoiding crowds are the ways to curb the virus spread and break the chain of transmission. On that note, to share more on how we can get through this period is Professor David Chan. Now, he's the Director of the Behavioural Sciences Institute at Singapore Management University. Hi, Prof. Now, Prof, Hello. If, if, if we could start off, you know, what would you say to those of us who are still tempted to venture outside our home, you know, to date, to socialise or to simply get out of the same four walls? You know, how important is it for everyone to strictly follow these circuit breaker measures? 
Well, for these reasons, if that's the reasons you, you want to go out, my what I want to say to you is please don't do it. Uh, there are many reasons to go out, and those are essential reasons. That's if you need to buy your groceries or you need to uh, do something that's really very important. Uh, but other than that, you should really stay at home. And there are really good reasons why you need to stay at home. Uh, first, uh, there will be other people walking around too. And so if you're not careful, if there's no safe distancing, or sometimes there are places get too crowded, like in the grocery stores, you can actually get infected, or you may even infect somebody because you could have the COVID virus uh, without symptoms and you yourself don't know it. Um, it is also possible for the virus to survive on surfaces. So uh, just, just because there are nobody around doesn't mean that you're not in any danger of getting infected. So I think it's very important to realize that uh, you should go out only if you really have to, and there's really no need to go out uh, uh, for many of the reasons that you just cited, such as you know to socialize, uh, go out just to get out of the four walls and so on. But I just want to emphasize that uh, the reason is really much more than that. We are in a very critical period, and I would uh, really uh, um, say to everybody that uh, this critical period is time sensitive, and think about the consequences of what happened. Think about the regret that just because you you yield to the temptation of going out, just because you felt bored, and what could that have done to other people? You could get infected, as I said, and you could infect others, and you could bring the virus back home. You could infect your family members, and when you go back to work soon, because maybe you are from an essential service, and you have to go out to work for a short while, you could infect your colleagues as well. And the chain of events is really very clear. Just mm -hmm. uh, one simple action, uh, doing it uh, rightly, and you don't do it, uh, not doing it, not not that you shouldn't do it and you do it could actually cause somebody's death eventually because our health care system is uh, our resources are really limited right well thanks so much for emphasizing those points professor chan so when the circuit breaker measures were first announced last friday people started to crowd food places and shopping areas for one last hurrah <laughs> that seems contrary to the message of asking people to avoid crowds and stay at home as much as possible do you think it would have been better if the measures implement, were implemented immediately uh, on the Friday or within a shorter time frame, perhaps uh, within 24 hours? Well, I'll put it this way. Uh, I think Singapore has done relatively well compared to many countries, uh, but the virus is a very rapidly evolving situation. Very often with uh, incomplete information and our leaders have to make decisions uh, very quickly. Um, so being decisive is very important. Uh, I would say that uh, the ways that we have done are very good, but it's definitely not perfect. And there are some things that we must learn from it. Uh, one of the things, as you mentioned, is the bars. And I would say that uh, when we announce of closing of bars, perhaps the time period from announcing to actual implementation could be shortened. Uh, why is that so? Because in crisis management, you cannot have a general rule and say, let's have 48 hours for people to prepare. You announce, you wait 48 hours, and then you implement. Now, you need to do that for things like uh, banning people from entering Singapore. Because if you don't give enough time, like 48 hours, somebody could have bought a plane, boarded a plane that is hard somewhere in the air. So you cannot mm -hmm. ban the person when the person is somewhere in the air. But in the case of closing bars, I'm not sure you need 48 hours uh, between announcement uh, and implementation, especially if it's over the weekend. You can warn everybody, you can tell people not to go to the bars. And because it's not officially implemented, uh, some people, as you said, will still go to the bars. And so I think it is important to learn from these lessons that mm. you don't need a blanket uh, time frame. Uh, depending on the measure, depending on the situation, there are some measures you need to give necessary preparation. There are others you just need to announce and implement it as soon as possible, perhaps almost in a matter of hours. I just want to add that I was just speaking to somebody who was um, uh, uh, manning a bar, and he said that, well, if you don't give me enough time, what about my perishables in the fridge? Well, the way I will respond to it is that surely your perishables cannot be more important than lives perishing. Uh, it is very important uh, to mm -hmm. know what is at stake. Yeah. So it's really a calibrated response and it's not a one-size-fits-all, uh, yeah, Prof. Now, Prof, I just want to move on uh, to talk about now, you know, we're all working from home. Of course, uh, most people are working from home except for those who are in essential services. How can one maintain efficiency and productivity uh, as we would in our normal physical work environment? Uh, well, it's not going to be easy, frankly speaking. Uh, uh, by the way, not everybody just started working from home today. Right? There are many people, including myself, some of us, we have started uh, working from home for quite some time. But it's going to be one whole month, and I think uh, everybody needs to make adjustments. I don't think anybody has actually experienced about one month of telecommuting uh, working from home. There are a few things to note. Uh, we all know from research that uh, if you monitor yourself, if you set goals, 
if you have physical arrangements whereby you are dis not distracted from uh, task irrelevant uh, uh, stimuli, then it will be okay. Now to translate that into English, what it means mm -hmm. is that in your house, try and find a corner where you can become your small little office space. Now that space is preferably not your bed with your TV in front of you because mm -hmm. you're going to fall asleep or you're going to watch the television and so on. Well, it's not going to be easy. Not every physical arrangement in the house is possible, but we just have to try and adjust. Um, we could also try to make sure we set a schedule uh, so that you're just like work, you know, there is lunchtime, there's getting to work, um, and there is a time where you can maybe take care, if you have a spouse, you know, to arrange, say, well, at this time you do this, at that time I do that, and so on. Uh, perhaps mm -hmm. one thing we should emphasize is that for those of us who are bosses or at least supervisors with direct reports or subordinates, uh, that we can call the shots, hold a meeting. Uh, do respect your uh, your colleagues and your direct reports a little bit, you know. Working from home doesn't mean 24 hours. So there is a time where your office should stop. And similarly, uh, you should not just because you prefer to work at night and you start calling a telecommuting a commuting meeting at night and everybody now has to give up whatever they are doing and meet you at night over, the, over online. Uh, that is uh, not the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. mm. Do you have additional advice for parents with children who start their full home-based learning from tomorrow? Um, well, I am sure parents are quite anxious because today everybody is supposed to, well, about 75% of the population is supposed to be working at home. And then tomorrow we have a home-based learning. What that means is that all your kids will be with you at home. And as we all know that when you have kids at home, it's not going to be so easy. Well, mm -hmm. the kids, to be, to be sure, the children are not at home playing. You know, they have home-based learning, so at least there are some hours of work. But at the same time, uh, especially for those who are not very familiar with online uh, laptop and so on, uh, they do need some supervision. So number one, I think it is important uh, if you have a spouse, you not know, to arrange with your spouse uh, for a proper timetable to take care of the kids, especially during meal times when you have younger children. Uh, you know, don't get too engrossed in your work and say let the young children go to the kitchen and cook and so on because accidents could actually happen. So it is quite important to occupy the children, supervise them, take turns, set a timetable, set some realistic goals perhaps and so on. Um, and, and bosses again need to be a bit understanding because it is not just about your subordinates in front of the computer all the time. Now the person has to take care uh, of, the, of the children as well if they are parents. Maybe one last word about parenting. Uh, I think parents should bear in mind that uh, you have brought your office back home and your children are with you. Your children are actually observing your work behaviours, in other words. So besides mm -hmm. controlling your temper, uh, it is quite important to set a good role model. Whatever you say about your bosses, your colleagues, and whatever you say to your children, whatever you say to your spouse, actually, you, you are teachers of your children's character right now. Yeah, those are definitely good advice there, uh, Prof. Prof, uh, just uh, on to our last question, uh, just looking forward, you know, uh, at the end of this four-week circuit breaker, do you foresee we will have fewer uh, COVID-19 cases or is there a possibility that we may need to extend beyond May 4th? Well, I think none of us know the answer. Uh, what we know is that factually all the cases that we see every day in our daily reports they are what I call lag outcomes, right? L-A-G-G-E-D, lag. In other words, there is a time lag. What you see today in the cases does not happen today. They are actually cases that are tested positive uh, after several recent days of infection, or even one or two weeks of infection. So no matter how effective your measures are is implemented today, it will take about two, three weeks before you actually see the results. We all hope that the uh, results will work, and the only way that it will work is everyone uh, try to stay at home as much as possible follow the guidelines really strictly. Um, I don't see any other way. Uh, that is really uh, the way to go about doing it. Um, well, we need to extend. Well, we will have to extend, I guess, if uh, everybody doesn't do uh, what we're supposed to do. Uh, and, and then uh, cases will continue to, to rise. Uh, but I don't think the issue is actually economy or extension per se. The issue is about lives and livelihood. Uh, once we realize that it's about lives and livelihood, then we begin to realize that you and I, just one person, whatever we do, can make a difference. We mm -hmm. could be the very one that make a difference to whether a person eventually uh, get an ICU treatment in a timely manner. And you could be the one that caused a person's uh, death or save a person's life. It's as, as, as simple as that. Well, thank you so much, Prof, for the advice. It's certainly a pleasure to speak uh, with you. Now, we've been talking to Professor David Chan, Director of the Behavioural Sciences Institute at SMU. It's the first day of the circuit breaker measures here in Singapore.
also in the headlines, Singapore reported 66 new COVID-19 cases yesterday, bringing the total number of cases here to 1,375. Of the new cases, 65 are local and one is imported. Two new clusters were also reported with three cases each. The first cluster is at Little Gems Preschool in Ang Mo Kio. The second is at Kranji Lodge, a foreign workers' dormitory. Meanwhile, six more cases were linked to Toguan Dormitory, which was gazetted as an isolation area yesterday. With 14 cases, it is the third foreign workers' dormitory to receive such an order after the S11 dormitory at Pungol and Westlight in Toguan. On the global front, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was moved to the ICU after his condition worsened. He had tested positive for the virus in March. While Mr Johnson had received oxygen treatment to help him breathe, officials have maintained that he is conscious and hasn't been put on a ventilator. Meanwhile, the epicentre of Wuhan reported zero new deaths for the first time since the outbreak started. After closing its borders to foreigners, mainland China reported a drop in new imported cases. There were 32 new confirmed cases involving travellers arriving from overseas yesterday, down from 39 the day before. Malaysia and Singapore are negotiating the terms of Malaysian citizens returning to their home country. Malaysia had earlier said that its citizens would be allowed to go home if they were certified free of COVID-19. But Singapore's health ministry said that there is no requirement for foreigners exiting Singapore to be swabbed on non-clinical grounds. The Malaysian defence minister, meanwhile, said on Monday that until these terms are finalised, Malaysian citizens will not be allowed to return from Singapore. In Parliament today, Minister for Trade and Industry Chan Chun Singh introduced the Parliamentary Co Elections COVID-19 Special Arrangements Bill today. The proposed law will allow the Elections Department to implement temporary arrangements to ensure the safety of voters, candidates and election officials if the upcoming general election takes place amid the COVID-19 situation. Voters who are under quarantine or stay-home orders, for example, will be able to vote outside of their electoral divisions at the designated facilities they are housed in. This will ensure that they don't mingle with other voters. An aspiring candidate may also authorise a representative to file his nomination paper on his behalf if he is ill or on a quarantine or stay-home order. Minister Chan said that the bill forms part of ELD's contingency plans for the next GE and has nothing to do with when the election will be called. He stressed that the government's immediate priorities remain tackling the pandemic. The Straits Times senior political correspondent Lam Yuan Si joins us now to discuss this. Yuan Si, do you think the bill covers all the bases in ensuring a safe election amid the COVID-19 outbreak? Well, we haven't seen the actual bill itself since it's not been made public yet, so it's really too soon to tell. But for now, we know that it will deal with two main aspects of an election under a coronavirus outbreak. Uh, one is how people who are on stay orders will vote, and two, how as far as well or required to stay home can complete their nomination. So when Trade and Industry Minister Chan Chun Singh introduced this bill in Parliament today, he said it would allow voters on stay orders to vote outside of their electoral divisions. So for safety, they obviously don't want these voters to mingle with other voters. Uh, it looks like this means they won't have to go down to the polling station and they may be able to vote from wherever they are serving out the stay orders. But they didn't specify how this would be done. For instance, you know, like will they online or will, will election uh, officials have to go to them, things like that, we wouldn't know. And then the second thing the bill allows is for an aspiring candidate who is uh, unwell or maybe on quarantine to authorise another person to file nomination papers on his or her behalf. Uh, this will be a first because under the current law, uh, candidates have to be present to file their papers on nomination day. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. back to your question, it doesn't seem all the aspects of elections that some people have been wondering about, such as, you know, how campaigning is going to be conducted, whether there are going to be rallies, and how safe distancing is going to be enforced at the polling stations for all the other voters who might not be unwell. And then another thing we know is that the provisions in the bill are temporary arrangements, and they will only apply to the next general election, which has mm. to be held by Department. Hmm. Back to you.
Right, thanks so much, Yuan Si. It appears we're having trouble connecting with you, but that was uh, our senior political correspondent, Tham Yuan Si. I want to hear your thoughts as well on how a safe GE can be held, so leave your comments below. Now, news just in, Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe today declared a month-long state of emergency in Tokyo and six other parts of the country over a spike in COVID-19 cases. The measure falls short of the strict lockdowns seen in other parts of the world, but empowers local governors to urge people to stay inside and to call for businesses to close. Now, those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, do log on to straightstimes.com. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Quay. Join us tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story. In the meantime, keep well and stay home. Thank you to all our frontline healthcare workers um, for working so tirelessly uh, during this crisis. And we can help them by staying at home and not hanging out with people outside our immediate household. If you need to makan or miss my mirrors, come to local hawkers, please. But I'm home, okay? Let's all do our part to stay home and be safe. First time in history, you get to save mankind by staying home and watching lots of TV. It's not a lot to ask. Please stay home. Stay home because you need to protect your loved ones. And if you're hungry, just order online and let us deliver to you. You know, now that circuit breaker measures have been announced, I can't believe some Singaporeans still need to be told what to do. Stay at home. It's simple. Three words. That's all you need to remember. On top of that, remember to wash your hands frequently. Remember your face is sacred. You're only going to go out to buy essentials. Stay at home. If you have the ability to stay home, please stay home. Let's do this for our healthcare workers. Let's do this for the people who can't. We got this. Stay home, stay safe, wash your hands regularly, and maintain a one meter social distancing. Let us all do our part and stay at home, okay? If you need food, you can always rely on your food panda. Deliveroo or Grab food riders. The COVID-19 virus may be airborne and survives a long time on surfaces. So do stay at home as much as you can. If you must go out, wear a mask. This will protect you and your loved ones. Please stay at home. I will send a food to you. Stay home, stay safe, take care of your hygiene. Spend some quality time with your loved ones. We all just want our loved ones to be safe and stay home and finally flatten the curve and help reduce the numbers every day. If any country can see this through, it is Singapore. We have the resources, we have the determination, we are united. By helping one another through this, we will prevail and emerge stronger.